Well, welcome everyone um, to the uh, session on open source blockchain's emerging role as the platform for digital currencies. Um, I'm Karen Otoni. I'm with Hyperledger, which is a sister project to Finos at the Linux Foundation. And I'm here with Makoto Takemiya from Soramitsu. And we're going to have a discussion today on um, CBDCs, digital currency, DeFi, and hear about the um, CBDC project that uh, Makoto has been building for the last couple of years. We are recording the session um, previously to the uh, live time, but Makoto and I will be available in the chat to answer your questions during this session and also um, if we have any time at the end before the next session starts. So um, let's get started then. Um, Makoto, please introduce yourself and share um, a little bit about Soramitsu, what you do there. Um, Soramitsu is a member of Hyperledger and, um, and you're very involved with the Hyperledger technology community uh, with the distributed ledger uh, Hyperledger Iroha. So please share a little bit about um, your involvement in our community. Yeah, sure. So it's great to be with you. Uh, and thanks a lot for the, um, the introduction. Um, so my name is Makoto Takemiya. I'm the CEO of Soramitsu. And uh, for those who may not know, uh, Soramitsu is a, I like to describe it as a boutique uh, fintech startup. Uh, we were originally based in, in Tokyo, Japan, but now we're, we're actually in a few different countries. Uh, we are still a very young company. We were founded in 2016. And uh, actually, if just a few months after being founded, we joined the Hyperledger project, which was a, actually a great honor for a small startup like ours. Um, I'm uh, actually a computer scientist by background. Uh, I studied and, and grew up in California, actually, <laughs> and uh, got my computer science degree. And then uh, after that, I moved to Japan and worked in a research lab uh, studying uh, neuroinformatics, actually, for... Um, for more than I think seven years, so <laughs> it's quite uh, and it's been an interesting uh, journey that brought me into blockchain. Um, but I've been in, in this industry since 2013, and it's been really fascinating. And um, I've had the honor of being part of many uh, different open source uh, blockchain projects. Um, I can talk a little bit more about uh, my company and, and what our vision is. Uh, so we uh, we we kind of wanted to build our own. Um, Kind of vision of, of blockchain. This is back in 2016, and we were focusing on uh, digital identity at that time. And uh, none of the current blockchains uh, at the time were really meeting our needs. And so that's kind of where, you know, through discussion with our engineers, that's how we built uh, this uh, this project called Iroha. That then we uh, we gave to uh, the Linux Foundation with other um, Hyperledger members uh, back in 2016, and that got accepted as an open source. Uh, one of the open source platforms in the Hyperledger project. Um, so it's been it's been a long journey, but it's been very interesting. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, so before we dive into talking more about your specific project, um, we might have some newcomers to the topic of DeFi, also known as decentralized finance, um, to peer-to-peer -peer payments and CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. Um, Maybe you could just give a sense for, you know, what are all these terms that people are throwing out there? Um, you know, DeFi now encompasses uh, stable coins and cryptocurrencies and all kinds of different things. And maybe just kind of level set for the audience here about um, what's going on in the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, payment space right now. So uh, when people think of uh, blockchain and peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrencies, they typically think of Bitcoin, which of course is the most famous and uh, kind of archetypal example. Um, but uh, since Bitcoin, there's been quite a lot of innovation over the past, uh, you know, uh, 12 years, uh, and so since the Bitcoin white paper came out, um, and um, uh, it's just so much that it's hard to even figure out where to begin to talk about. But some of the, the more recent and exciting trends are DeFi or decentralized finance. And this is an idea where you go beyond just having a cryptocurrency and maybe some you know peer-to-peer -peer payment system that's using a blockchain. And you actually provide more um, robust uh, financial services on top. 
Um, and an example would be like a peer-to-peer -peer loan where uh, you could have one token as an asset that's a collateral and you can uh, either mint or provide a, a new type of token uh, from this collateral. And, and this, you know, it's just managed automatically by the rules of the system. So you don't have to worry about things like, you know, people defaulting on loans or, um, or, or financial crisis like we had in maybe 2008. Um, on the other hand, if you build the rules of the system in a bad way, you could have new types of financial crises. So it's quite a, an interesting uh, playground that's, uh, that's doing quite a lot. Now, uh, in the DeFi sphere, there's many different types of applications. And uh, of course, things like stable coins uh, for payment are very interesting. And there's different types of stable coins. So a stable coin typically is pegged to some type of index, like for example, the US dollar. And it could either be backed by real dollars, uh, like in a vault or something, or it could be backed by another type of currency that's actually equal to dollar or, or even worth more than the dollar, like something like a synthetic asset that like if you want, um, you know, $1, uh, but you only have ether, uh, then you can actually put in, you know, like maybe $1.50 worth of ether into a smart contract, and then you can mint a new type of dollar stable coin. And um, the innovation here is really not so much as in these, you know, these financial mechanics, but rather the concept of composability. So um, by having this on a blockchain and, and all these clear inputs and outputs from these different applications, um, you have just, you have what uh, you know IBM I think used to call the a the API economy. You ha you actually have a way to create a digital economy where everything is just connected by these you know kind of like API calls or by interfaces, mm -hmm. and you can build uh, really really complex um, applications that even the designers of maybe a piece of it couldn't have um, envisioned before. Um, and that's kind of like going on in the public blockchain space. So. Um, uh, there is some uh, work in the Hyperledger project that's uh, contributing that, but there's also many more um, public blockchains in this. So, for example, you know, the, of course, the work in Ethereum, which now is very closely related to Hyperledger. Um, and then there's uh, Polkadot, which is doing some really interesting work there. So our, uh, our company actually works very closely with Web3 Foundation, which is a nonprofit in Switzerland who's uh, working on building this kind of interledger um, Polkadot and Kusama. Uh, yeah. protocols mm -hmm. which is really an exciting ecosystem and then you have countless other um, platforms um, now this innovation is being done in the completely open and um, dare i say uh, rather unregulated uh, space so this is kind of like a whole bunch of you know computer scientists and and you know people going out there and, and playing around with different things and right. this is really exciting because um, people are, are testing new things that never existed before um, but on the other hand, uh, there are very serious uh, financial institutions that are looking at um, some of these concepts and figuring, figuring out how does this fit into the uh, existing financial markets infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So central banks are one of these. And um, you know, many central banks around the world um, are studying uh, you know, so-called central bank digital currencies and, uh, and ways to take some of these concepts of tokenized uh, money and, uh, and um, you know, Build this in, as a, you know, into the infrastructure of their national economies, which is quite, um, quite a new idea. Um, um, bare assets that have value, like cash, are, are nothing new. But uh, doing this in a digital form is very, um, very new for uh, for banks to look at. And so, um, it, it also has new challenges, um, especially regulatory challenges. But uh, it also has quite a lot of very uh, potential to uh, to that didn't exist yet and uh, so the whole the whole DeFi space and the C space I think are very hot buzzwords now in fact these um, I think this have been and uh, I would say in the blockchain space well thanks for um, sharing a little bit about this evolution of what's been happening in um, digital currencies. As you mentioned, you know, Bitcoin kind of started this. It is it is an open source technology. Um, it's public. Uh, nobody owns it, right, or controls, and everyone can take part in it and contribute to it and add to it. Um, do you think we could have gotten to the point of central banks really digitizing their currencies without Bitcoin if we didn't have 
um, that that star in this uh, open source technology that that uh, Satoshi developed? <laughs> Well, yeah, that's a, a good question. So it was really Bitcoin that started it all. Obviously, a lot of the ideas were not completely new to Bitcoin. You know, the idea of, uh, you know, digital money or even like a tokenized uh, form of uh, assets uh, or tokens was uh, right. was nothing 100% new. There were other um, types of applications. But really what uh, Satoshi was able to do was, you know, make this uh, in a way where um, there's no central authority to take the responsibility or the blame um, <laughs> for building something like that. Um, and that that actually is what, uh, in many ways, enables uh, DeFi or decentralized finance applications, because um, a lot of these experiments and ideas, you couldn't actually run, um, you know, because, because the legal structure hasn't potentially, you know, caught up uh, to that in many areas. So... Um, uh, Satoshi created really like a worldwide, um, you know, new type of supranational currency. And, uh, uh, you know, more than 10 years later, uh, you know, Facebook came out to do the same and they still, you know, still haven't been able to succeed in that because of the regulatory hurdles. And so, um, but Satoshi didn't ask anyone, he just uh, <laughs> put it out there. Um, but yeah, the fact that it's open source uh, gave a lot of resilience uh, to Bitcoin, obviously. Uh, no one would trust a closed source uh, payment system like that because, you know, money is all based on, it's really a form of trust. Right. Um, and uh, I would say that without Bitcoin, central banks wouldn't really be considering um, a tokenized uh, version of central bank liabilities either. Uh, because, you know, as we all know, um, a digital central bank money already exists, uh, especially for wholesale uh, uses. Um, and the idea of creating something like um, akin to a bearer asset that's digital, I think, is nothing uh, that uh, would be considered uh, if, you know, Bitcoin hadn't shown potentially the utility of something like this. Um, and uh, But Bitcoin is just, you know, one, one small start. I really don't think it can be... Um, you know, overemphasized uh, how important uh, composability is in these spaces. So being able to have some kind of token where the the transfer of the token transfers the ownership in, in real time. You know, the transfer is the transfer not just of the token, but ownership itself. Mm -hmm. um, that's really a very powerful concept in many types of uh, financial markets infrastructure. And, um, and that, I think, is going to pave a, a way to much... Um, you know, a huge revolution in, in global um, financial markets uh, and uh, hopefully, um, you know, increase the efficiency of uh, things like payments and settlements and different types of, you know, fundraising that uh, corporations do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, before, um, before DeFi became sort of the coin term, the, the term that was being used is open finance. And um, it's a real change that was, you know, Bitcoin is part of that evolution and maybe it really kind of kickstarted things. Um, but, you know, uh, it's that openness that really is what's different about what's being done now and the fact that it's, you know, tokenized or digital, therefore more transparent and more accessible. Um, why do you think it's important, though, to use open source technologies versus um, you know, something that a government is just building in-house or a company is just building in-house um, as their own technology. Why is open source important um, in digital payments and um, more specifically in CBDCs? Well, I would argue that uh, not just open source, but other types of open uh, technologies are very important um, for advancing mankind. But uh, just to specifically answer your question, um, so open source is really exciting uh, for new and innovative payment systems like blockchain-based or DLT-based uh, payment systems uh, that haven't uh, existed before, uh, because if it's not open, then central banks or other types of corporations uh, wouldn't want to trust, um, you know, a single vendor because the technology is too it's too new. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. even a lot of the, most of the technologies we're talking about are less than five years old, and so. Um, if, you, if you're a central bank, uh, you, you know, you're, you're not going to trust like a, a young startup like that um, unless unless you have guarantees that, you know, it's if, even if this company goes away, the, the core component is open and, uh, and we can, 
you know, either take our own developers and continue it, or there's a community around it and we can you know, continue with that. So really it's about, um, you know, many people creating these building building blocks and then uh, allowing it to come together. Um, again, it's a composability um, and it helps people to collaborate. Um, just to give an example, um, uh, I, would, I guess this couple of years ago, Hyperledger Ursa uh, was, you know, uh, was approved and uh, it's a cryptographic library. It has many different types of complex uh, cryptographic algorithms that have been uh, vetted by professionals and, um, and you know, writing your own cryptography is a terrible idea in any project. And so um, every, every blockchain project uh, typically, you know, uh, uses, you know, different libraries and, and sometimes um, even the same implementation or sorry, different implementations of the same spec um, can have minor differences on some edge cases. And, and this makes it really hard, especially in blockchain, um, because you have, you have to get consensus about some data, it makes it really hard uh, to get the exact same answer in some edge cases. And so Hyperledger Ursa helps a lot with this by standardizing, um, you know, some of the key algorithms that people use. If you're just using, you know, digital signature algorithm, you have it here in this library and you don't have to worry about, um, you know, is this, who created this library? Is it, you know, can I, can I trust it in, in my code? Um, or should I write my own algorithm? That, that, be crazy, but um, so Hyperledger Ursa has been really powerful in enabling uh, many uh, blockchain projects out there, and I think um, right. that's just one of you know dozens of examples um, of how, uh, at least in the blockchain space, uh, open source has helped uh, significantly. Yeah, yeah, I think sometimes um, you know it, it can be seen as uh, governments might see it as more risky. Um, to not have something that they are in control of or that, uh, you know, they can, uh, you know, put their specific requirements on. Um, so it's definitely something that I think, you know, a lot of, we hear that a lot of banks are considering um, both kinds. Um, and it'll be interesting because uh, each, go each government is, is, uh, taking their own approach to it. Um, you know, the, the Bank of Information System just came out with a report um, where uh, the Bank of England, Japan, uh, Sweden, Switzerland, and, and, and the U.S. as, as well um, talked about, um, you know, what are the core requirements um, that, that need to, to be there for uh, an effective central bank digital currency, not just for the domestic use, but also to facilitate cross-border payment use. Um, but, you know, it's still kind of up to those different uh, banks to choose whether or not they're going to be doing something um, in-house, homemade, proprietary with the vendor, or, or something where they're leveraging open source with you know, maybe even the help of um, some service provider to help them build it. Um, I think the, the debate is, is still going on about what is uh, uh, more stable, what's more sure, what's more um, uh, or less risky, because um, there's real uh, conservatism uh, in central banks that, you know, they can't, you know, you can't mess up. <laughs> um, you know, it has to be something that they feel very, 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 very sure is stable um, and, and confident in. Yeah, so the that's a good point as, as well. Um, but um, it's it's also important to remember that technology is just one part of the larger <clears throat> uh, larger picture, and that technology changes very fast. Right. Um, so the yeah the report you're referencing from the Bank for International St Settlements, um, I think it was a really key report. It came out in um, in October and uh, and had seven central banks, including Bank of Japan, uh, as uh, members of it. But it's very interesting research report because it laid out kind of what are the um, what are the desideratum or what are the desired features of, uh, of different CD, CDBCs, CBDCs. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, but most of it was really about, you know, things like uh, monetary policies. So uh, none of these, uh, you know, uh, tokenized uh, fiat uh, currencies should, uh, you know, of course, change um, monetary policy or provide systemic risks. Um, uh, as far as technology goes, they were mainly concerned about things like, um, you know, uh, is it uh, is it going to run twenty four seven, or is it going to be able to make uh, some kind of offline transactions, uh, perhaps you know, with some limitations, and uh, and things like this, and, and of course 
cost as well because um you know uh <laughs> if you have infinite money you can do almost anything but um uh, that doesn't mean that uh you, you know it's that you wouldn't have users if the cost uh, was too high and so they're really thinking about you know how do we create um like a simple form of digital cash um which is a big trend um but um yeah i would I don't think the report emphasized the technology enough. Of course, I'm a technologist, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I do think that um, open technologies um, help a lot. Some central banks don't like openness that much uh, because they're worried about security. And this is, right. you know, of course, security by obs obscurity. Um, so it's, it doesn't make sense to just try to, um, uh, you know, hide things. You should have like real mathematically proven security in your system instead. Um, but, uh, but I do think a, a good argument against uh, focusing on technology too much in these systems is that it, uh, it, the technology honestly does uh, change a lot. Um, and that's for having different standards for messaging and um, interoperability between systems. So like interledger protocols, the stuff, uh, the stuff we've been focusing on um, as well mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is really key. And that, that also goes with the international payments as well. Right. Right. Well, let's get let's get into um, some of the more specifics of what um, you've been doing at Soramitsu, specifically with the Bank of Cambodia um, and the project Bakong, which just officially launched um, in October. It's been in operation for a year or so now, at least um, in in a in a, a semi official launch, um, but officially last month, which is very very exciting. Um, uh, and so, please share a little bit more about how that project, uh, you know, started off and where um, what you've been building the last couple of years leading up to this official launch. Yeah, so uh, Project Pakong in uh, Cambodia is a is a you know real time um, payment system that anyone in the country can use just with their mobile phone, which is kind of a really interesting um, use case. Uh, most central banks haven't really ventured uh, too much into this uh, space before. Um, I think probably an easy way to to explain it is actually to show it um, because I do have it on the app on my phone. Um, here, I'll just share my screen uh yeah. real quick yeah that'd be great technology is driving us crazy but um um you should be able to see my screen now so um uh what you see here is just the wallet screen so it's a very simple digital wallet uh, this is a white label app that the central bank um you know provides uh, to commercial banks so my uh, there's a commercial bank here at the top foreign trade bank of Cambodia, and then there's some balance um, like in Khmer real and us dollar uh, and it's really simple. You can send and receive money using QR codes. Um, anyone can scan this and <laughs> send me money. Um, and then you can also send, uh, for example, uh, some uh, some money here. I'll send uh, two cents. I'm feeling <laughs> feeling generous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, hit send, confirm, and then um, you can just hit send. And then you get you know your receipt of the the payments, some details here, and then. Um, actually, it's already done. <laughs> so it says success here on the screen. So people, this image of like blockchain being a slow thing for payments, uh, a lot of that is because, you know, Bitcoin takes, you know, 10 minutes or, or geez, in the worst case, sometimes you, you're waiting like 40 minutes or an hour right. um, for your, for your block to get mined. And, um, but, but because this is using a permission blockchain technology, it's, it's, you know, much faster. And so it's just a two to three seconds. And, um, and, and that's that's from the whole stack, like from, you know, my phone to the commercial bank to the um, to the central bank and then back to my phone. So it's, it's really, it's doing quite a lot um, uh, in, in that two to three seconds. Um, but um, uh, any, anyway, so the, this is the, uh, the simple overview of the app. I don't want to spend uh, too much time showing it off, but um, the, the cool thing about this is uh, anyone in the country uh, with a Cambodian phone number can send and receive digital money now. And um, this digital money is actually, you know, the ledger is being managed by the central bank, which is really, really cool um, concept. It means that um, under the right circumstances in the future, this could be, you know, it can, can enable open banking like you discussed, where um, through API access, you could you could have digital money in your application in a safe and secure way, which is very, a very, very cool um, thing. Um, but 
but yeah, I don't want to <laughs> to talk forever and, about my own. And is uh, and using it doesn't cost anything for just to send this. Um, well, I mean that's that's really up to the banks uh, currently because it's a new system. Uh, it, there's no transaction fees involved, but um, you, you know that like it's it's not up to us. It's up to um, central bank and commercial banks. Um, now we worked uh, just to tell the story real quick. Um, of this. So the, the Central Bank of Cambodia actually, um, uh, I guess from 2016, they were studying uh, you know, CBDCs and blockchain and mm -hmm. different things like that. Um, and they approached us and then uh, from 2017, we worked on this. So it took, took a couple of years uh, and then we released the first pilot in July of 2019. And then, um, and then uh, it's officially launched uh, last month. Um, unfortunately, um, I wasn't able to be there in person because of, uh, uh, you know, the current, you know, pandemic and it's, hard. <laughs> it's right. very hard uh, times to travel, um, right. unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think NBC, uh, Central Bank of Cambodia should really be, um, you know, uh, congratulated because they had quite a lot of foresight um, for looking at this and, uh, and our engineers worked with their, their engineers and their team, um, you know, to realize this system. So it's really very, um, it, it's really a very technocratic, uh, public-private uh, type of partnership, and um, I, I think it was very successful. And it was based, uh, you know, around open source technologies like Hyperledger Iroha, which is the uh, the blockchain that we use. Right. And um, and how did the project evolve? So when they when you started working on this with them in 2016, um, is it is it the same thing that it is now? Like, did it first start off as you know, let's just digitize payments, and and that and then it became something else, or what was sort of the evolution of the project? Well, it's it's hasn't really changed all that much. Uh, they had a very clear vision, I think, from the beginning, which was uh, that they wanted to have. Um, you know, a retail uh, accessible payment system because uh, there is very high unbanked uh, proportion in the country and, um, and you know, things like credit cards are very rare uh, mm -hmm. in Cambodia. So um, it's hard to have a digital economy without uh, robust digital payments. And I think um, they had the strategic vision and they saw the opportunity and they took it, which is very, um, right. you know, very forward thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, from what I understand, the only officially launched uh, CBDC, other than the Project Sand Dollar, um, out of the Bahamas, um, these are the two that are uh, live and available to all citizens. Um, is is it exactly a CBDC, or is it a little bit different than what the Project Sand Dollar is doing, or the Bank of England and Bank of France is considering? Um, just so that uh, the audience can understand the particularities of what's similar or different about what, what else they're hearing out there. Um, yeah, I think uh, the system is very similar to Project Sand Dollar uh, in uh, technical architecture. It's also similar to what uh, People's Bank of China um, has, which is a, um, a two-tier system, in, for example, in China where, and, in, and in Cambodia, where you have a central bank running the master ledger and then um, all the uh, consumers are intermediated by um, by commercial banks who, mm -hmm. who manage the customers and onboard customers, do KYC, AML, you know, all the traditional things. Um, and then uh, and, and and then you know the, the mobile apps connect uh, to the central bank through the um, uh, the commercial banks. So it's kind of a it's two tier architecture that's um, actually fairly proven and scalable. Um, I think it's a very you know, reasonable approach. Um, the only other architecture I would say that's viable is to do um, to do something a little bit more decentralized where you would have, for example, instead of the central bank running the whole ledger, maybe have um, commercial banks joining, joining in on um, uh, validation of uh, transactions and things like that. So I'm not familiar with any central banks doing that, um, but uh, I do know that um, over the years, there's been proposals like that and there's been uh, lots of experiments. There's quite, a lot of very interesting experiments going on in the world, but um, to actually pull the, the trigger and make these things live, um, you know, it takes, um, it, it takes a little bit, it, it's not just a technological thing. It's also, you know, there's politics, there's, you know, Absolutely. other types of regulatory issues. Yeah, and that was something I wanted to ask is, you know, 
did the government of Cambodia create new regulations or change their regulations in order to make this project possible? Well, they didn't uh, need to change too much. So um, this is really just, uh, there's, there's no changes in monetary policy because it's very strictly 100% um, reserved uh, fiat. So it's kind of like just a stable coin or you know, kind of, it's very similar to tr traditional payment systems that already exist. And so central bank um, is allowed to, to build payment systems and that's their job. Um, and so they did that. Uh, one thing that needed to be uh, kind of approved by um, the, the regula regulatory side was um, this, it's, there's a two tier for uh, onboarding uh, users. So um, anyone with a phone number can uh, sign up and, and use the system and you get a daily limit. So you, you have a very small limit of transactions. You can use it for buying you know, some food or something, but you can't buy a car. Um, but if you wanted to have higher value transactions, you actually have to physically go to a bank and, and do, you know, um, do KYC and onboard. Uh, and then they, the bank will set the limit to, uh, they can actually do, I think, any, anything they want. But, um, mm. okay. So it's, it's a two-tier uh, system. So getting this lower tier uh, accepted had to be done by the uh, regulatory, um, the regulator in the country. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's fairly low risk because low value transactions you know, are really uh, somewhat hard to use in, in important uh, crime. And um, also uh, to get a phone number anyway in Cambodia, you have to provide a passport scan. So there is, it, it is, you know, it's not an anonymous way to do payments um, because at the end of the day, um, if a police agency or something wanted to find out who made a transaction, they could do it. Um, mm -hmm. there's, way, there were, there's ways to find out. Um, right. But, uh, but it, it does have clear separation of, of data and who, who controls what. So the central bank doesn't really know the identity of anyone um, doing anything because you know, that's done by the commercial banks who, who, um, who manage the customers. And so um, I think that's, it's always important to have um, you know, some, uh, some segregation between you know, who can see what uh, in right. the system. You don't, right. you don't want a single entity um, that, that has uh, you know, godlike powers uh, in any system like this. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned the financial inclusion aspect. You showed us the, um, the app and how it works. Um, you know, could you share a little bit more about what this means for, um, you know, the average Cambodian day to day? You know, what does it allow them to do that maybe they couldn't do before? Well, I think it makes uh, doing any kind of digital payment a lot easier. Um, it wasn't completely impossible before, uh, but it was pretty hard to do, especially in a real-time way. Like you couldn't, um, you, you couldn't do something like you know similar uh, UI or UX to um, uh, credit card processing, where you go to a website, you log in, and you're done. Um, it is a little bit harder, involving some SMSs and things like that. Um, so that that. That, that opens up a whole new way, a whole new area of digital commerce that didn't really exist uh, before. So I'm, I think that's very exciting. Um, uh, other ways uh, that it helps are, I would say it, um, it helps kind of make all the, uh, I don't know, the, the payments a lot faster and more efficient. So up until now, a lot of people have used cash for everything. Right. And in cash, you know, you have to carry it and do all these things and give change. And it, it, it takes time uh, to do everything. Mm -hmm. And um, especially now with the pandemic, you know, people are worried about cash and, and <laughs> all, all these, you know, sanitary issues as, uh, as well. And so um, just, the, just the efficiency increase in the payment space, if, if uh, you know, if the whole population used this system, it could easily add, you know, 1% of GDP uh, just by the efficiency in payment. Mm -hmm. um, just you know the time wasted and you know giving change and going to the yeah. back and you know, it's it's quite it, it adds up at, uh, at the scale of the economy and so um it's this you know can can help uh, just give more efficiency and in a developing country that's every little bit helps because it, it right. gives people you know if you can barely afford you know food or, or you know house um you know just having a little bit extra uh, can help uh, quite a lot yeah, no, that's that's um, that's so true, and it's it's really exciting um, to see. It, it'll be really exciting to see, um, you know, what what we will begin to hear from uh, Cambodians using 
um, using this this uh, payment service, um, the impact of of you know that efficiency of not having to go to the bank, of not having to take out cash or carry so much cash. There's security there too, right? Um, not having to have so much cash on your person. Um, uh, I wanted to also ask you, um, you know, uh, oh, and by the way, I wanted to just let our audience know, um, if you want to learn even more about this, um, uh, this case study, actually, we have um, a report, uh, a case study that we've developed at Hyperledger on our website about Project Bakong. So that's another place that you can learn more before we um, go into my next question, where I was just listening to this podcast where it was, um, it was Coindesk Reima Money Reimagined, and I was listening to the uh, premiere of Bermuda, talk with the podcast hosts and saying that, you know, they were actually moving away from um, building their own CBDC um, and instead are investing in private sector innovation coming to Bermuda um, in order to build uh, stable coins um, and, and other forms of digital payments. Um, rather than spending resources on building their own government infrastructure, which we talked about earlier, you know, is something that, um, you know, uh, while working with open technologies can seem risky, um, it can also be very risky to kind of build your own with, with a technology that's changing so quickly, like you mentioned. Um, uh, and part of the thing, one of the things that um, the premier mentioned in that discussion was, um, you know, having to deal with that changing technology and the vendor lock-in. And so, um, you know, for anyone who is in government looking to use this, why, um, why does it benefit government to use open source technologies for these kinds of um, uh, projects? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and I think maybe it's over overlooked by a lot of uh, governments. Um, actually, I know the podcast you're talking about uh, with the Premier David Burt. And um, um, I had the honor of meeting him, uh, gee, last year in Davos. Um, mm -hmm. I met all three of the participants on the podcast, actually, at the, uh, at the GBBC, the Global Blockchain Business Council. Um, yeah. In Davos uh, last year, um, which, which was really a great um, opportunity. And um, I actually spoke, uh, yeah, to Premier Bird and uh, one of his um, uh, one of his technical advisors, who's there, and uh, quite a lot about their uh, stablecoin regulation and also digital identity regulation um, that he talked about. But um, yeah, they're 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 well, you know, Bermuda's a fairly small market, um, and so uh, they do have uh, perennial difficulties in getting like new um, services to come in. At, you know, come down there and set up shop just because there's there's so few um, uh, consumers that it's hard to justify uh, from a you know monetary standpoint. So uh, they're they're targeting a lot of um, kind of like supranational services. So things like stablecoin issuance, uh, where you know you can issue uh, a stablecoin that's backed by U.S. dollars that are sitting in in bank vaults or you know on bank balance sheets in Bermuda, and then. Um, and then use these stable coins all over the world with, with some clear uh, or regulatory clarity, which is kind of a really cool thing. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a good step in the right direction. I was a little bit disappointed that they don't uh, support synthetic assets. Uh, so they actually do want, you know, fully collateralized, um, you know, um, uh, stable coins, uh, which, which I think uh, uh, maybe is, is not the, not the most interesting to, uh, thing to me personally, but um, but yeah, they they wanted to not build their own system or even uh, choose uh, you know choose the winner um, for anything like digital identity or with the uh, stable coins because they wanted different market participants to come in, set up shop there, and then compete, and then um, have a clear and equal uh, regulatory playground, which is kind of a cool idea. So their idea is like um, instead of creating a Bermudan digital identity, you know. 100 companies can come and set up their own digital identity. That's totally cool. Um, mm -hmm. and we'll, um, we'll treat these as, you know, the ones we, we approve, you know, we'll treat these as a, a legal form of um, some kind of digital identity um, in, in uh, you know, on the island. Um, and, um, and 
and so th that's one way to do it. Uh, so you don't have any vendor lock-in because you don't have any vendors. <laughs> um, <laughs> you just uh, you just let you know anyone come in and kind of set up shop with a regulatory framework. Um, that that works if you have something that there's a clear market demand for, like stable coins, um, or even or even digital identity, which you know you could use anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, supposedly so th these types of applications make sense for something like a domestic uh, payment system it's a little bit harder um, to, to justify so like uh, you'd have to actually have a vendor come in and actually make the um, sacrifice to actually pay pay the money and set up a, you know set up a system here in, in this country which is not not the, not the biggest place in, in the world and so um, yeah so so having everything open source, you know, allows maybe uh, the government of a small nation like that to uh, to be able to maybe they could build their own system even using these composable parts that other companies have, like for example that we made um, mm -hmm. and then made open source, because then you don't have to uh, to worry about you know having like a, a license that you have to keep buying or um, or some kind of proprietary system that you're not sure what the uh, the quality is. Right. Right. It's, it's um, again, kind of goes back to there's so many different approaches to this and, and each government is really taking, you know, just, just not too far away. We have Project Sand Dollar out of Bahamas that's taken a very different approach. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to see what's being done uh, or what, and what will, what will be coming out more and more. Um, we just heard actually um, there was news today that the Bank of Australia is developing something um, with a couple of vendors. So um, uh, it's not clear yet what technology they're using. Um, uh, seems like it may be something Ethereum based, but will it be public? Will it be permissioned? Um, you know, that's uh, that's for us to continue to follow and, and, and find out as, as central banks explore the many different ways in which you can go about digitizing your currency. Um, so um, before uh, we wrap up here, I wanted to see, you know, what are some of the, you know, you are part of this this project, Bakong project, one of the few formally officially launched CBDCs out there. What are some of the lessons learned that you have in building the technology, implementing it, um, working with governments that might be helpful to anyone else who's exploring that? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things that really led to uh, the success of the project was um, being able to um, you know, work directly with uh, the government and really have uh, the, the central bank being one of the core stakeholders. So having that kind of, um, you know, buy-in from the team that actually has to run the system uh, is very important. Um, and I don't think it, you know, it, we would just have been wasting our time without having, you know, that that very uh, you know, special support and, and actually having them uh, work on it. Um, so I think being able to find the right stakeholders, being able to find people with the passion and then a clear use case that also, um, you know, is, is easily justifiable makes sense. So in Cambodia, you know, financial inclusion is a big problem. And this is a clear solution. It's not just about um, using technology for the sake of the technology. Um, you, you want to use it to solve a, a real need that people have. And if you do that, uh, then it's not really, you know, the rest will kind of come into place, I think, in, in many ways. Um, but um, I, I, I think it's really important for small companies too not to be afraid uh, to to try to do big challenges because they, um, you know, technology uh, is not evenly distributed, um, and a lot of small companies have really state-of-the-art technology that um, that sometimes no one else has, and uh, that should be. Um, that should be appraised uh, and, and you know, you know, understood uh, by the market and, and different right. participants as well. So, um, and never be afraid to to make things open. Um, uh, you, you know, a lot of people said, you know, why did we spend so much money and time on open source? And uh, <laughs> and for us, really, well, part of it's just my own philosophy, and I, I really like, for example, what you know Tesla did with making their patents open. Um, right. And, and things like that, or, you know, yeah. giving an open license for that. And um, really, you know, life is really short and, and you don't want to waste time. So it's really important to be able to, to have others reuse some of the effort uh, that you've done 
and even contribute uh, back to it. Um, and uh, it's that collaboration, I think, that really makes, uh, you know, life worth living. And uh, without, <laughs> without that collaboration, you're just, you know, fighting the, the whole world always. And that's not a, a very fun thing to do. Right. And, you know, we are here at a Linux Foundation event and, um, you know, our, um, the, the DLTs that we work with are part of the Linux Foundation. I think that's been part of the, the history of, um, of, you know, open source technology is that it, it, it fosters um, and um, really builds innovation and allows um, that progress to happen in a way that's um, much more accelerated, I think, that's been, um, you know, stated over and over that, um, you know, the innovation accelerates when people have more um, access to how things are done and, and can kind of look under the hood and then see, okay, this is what, you know, I could, I could now take this and, and improve upon it. Um, and it just, you know, really accelerates from there in a way that probably, or, you know, really can't, I think, um, uh, in a way where you've only got, you know, a, a few eyes looking at it, you know, rather than uh, the world's <laughs> view on it. Yeah, it increases security quite a lot too, and that's something I didn't touch on, uh, but uh, I don't think that could be, um, you know, overstated either, that uh, having, you know, for systemically important infrastructure, you want the core part to be open source, is my, <laughs> my personal right. opinion. Right, well, you know, trust, transparency, and security is the promise of digital currencies. Um, you know, there's different concerns that different people have for that uh, security and that transparency. Some people don't want governments being able to see who they are and, and how they're spending their money. Um, uh, startups and financial institutions have had major issues with um, security uh, breaches and transparency as well. So um, just to wrap up our discussion here, what is, the outlook, um, what's next for Project Bakong? And also, you know, what do you sort of see, um, or are you excited about in, in, in the DeFi, CBDC, peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments space? Oh, okay, yeah, so, um, so for, for Bakong, um, yeah, just uh, to further, you know, expand, increase users, um, there's some usability increases that can be done by making, you know, specific, uh, applications for businesses and payment terminals and even integration with card networks. Um, these are all things that um, uh, I'm very excited on over the next uh, year. Um, so that uh, should be fun. Uh, for in the DeFi space, uh, I didn't talk too much about it, but we're doing some really cool stuff. Uh, we're working on, a, uh, we got a grant for a DEX in a decentralized exchange in uh, the Polkadot ecosystem that's called uh, PokaSwap. Um, so that's uh, actually um, uh, in the future, we're, we're hoping to use Hyperledger Iroha version two um, uh, as part of that uh, ecosystem. So that's, uh, that's a really exciting um, project that we're doing. Um, other than that, yeah, we're also doing some, I, I would say pretty cool experiments with like a decentralized economic system called Sora and, uh, and different things. So we, we make a, quite a lot of open source applications uh, as well. So before, or besides uh, just a Hyperledger project, we also contribute, uh, you know, to other types of open source. So we're working with Web3 Foundation and also uh, Protocol Labs uh, on Filecoin. Um, so we, we're doing some cool things. Uh, it's my dream uh, that many of these pieces and ideas can kind of come together and uh, as part of this we're working on Hyperledger Iroha 2 which is kind of taking taking some of the things that we've learned uh, and you know improving on them you know creating new ideas and um, I think Iroha 2 is going to be very very well the philosophy is very different it's going to be really hard to compare it to other um, systems uh, uh, when we're done yeah. um, that's it's going to be a fun year uh, over the Hopefully, um, hopefully next year is going to be better than uh, 2020. Um, yes. Hard, hard to be worse, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all, I think we Not all hope for that. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, I, th I think I'm, I'm really excited about being in the space and uh, technology is uh, in a good place, I think. There's nothing short to read about in the, on this topic. Um, and 
Uh, I'll be sure to post some of the things that we've referenced in the chat here during the event, um, the case study on Project Bakong, um, some information about Hyperledger Roja, the podcast I mentioned. So um, if anyone wants to learn more um, and continue their reading or listening, um, I'll share the links there. Thank you so much, Makoto, for um, sharing what you've done and your insights on um, launching one of the first CBDCs out there. And um, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure to be on and uh, enjoy your Thursday, everyone. <laughs> and thank you to Open Source Strategy Forum for having us as well.